Hello. Welcome back to another Pen Talk. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for coming along the ride as I travel through the world of fountain pens. I love vintage. I've always loved vintage. You know, I used to go to flea markets and antique shops and thrift shops to buy vintage and um, that kind of didn't appeal to me as much. I found eBay, which appeals to me very well. So occasionally I come across things and I say they will look interesting. I place a bid, I win an auction, pens arrive. And here are three examples of my recent foray into the vintage world on eBay. They came from uh, Vancouver, British Columbia, maybe a neighbor of Doug. And I just thought the color was interesting. They're watermen, so I feel very comfortable with uh, how they're going to write. And they are a very interesting resin, a very interesting design. You know, the engravings are pretty clear on the barrels. In good shape. This tag is very interesting. So my guess is these were sitting in someone's antique store, maybe on consignment, maybe not. This seller primarily deals in coins. So this was something different for them. And eventually, I'm certain they just decided to put them up on eBay and, and get rid of them. I always enjoy a set. So this is a nice pen and pencil set. And it's always good to get a third pen along the ride. Just to put things in perspective on the size of these pens, here's a Pen BBS 308, which is, is about an average size pen. As you can see, these are on the small side, but that doesn't bother me. It's how they write that's important. So we're going to delve into these a little bit more deeply, clean them up, restore them, getting into writing order, and show them to you again. Just to clarify my <clears throat> intentions with uh, these types of short restoration videos is not to show you every detail of a restoration, but pretty much to show off the pen and maybe discuss some of the unique parts of the restoration that I felt were appropriate. If you want to learn more about all the details of doing a restoration, I, I have an excellent video that I'll put in the link that shows you every step by step of the process from receiving a vintage pen that has not been restored and may have been sitting for how many years, bringing it to full function and working order. So I suggest you look at that video if you would want more details that are not included in this short video. Here we are at stage one. The sections pulled out easily on both of these pens and inside was an almost intact bladder, latex sac, however you want to refer to it as, not calcified. So the sac is relatively new. These pens are probably made in the 50s. And don't think the 60s because I don't think Waterman was doing lever fillers uh, by the 60s. But, you know, these are going to be easy to restore, clean up, and everything else, but that's my first look at it. And the pencil works fine, so that's the other thing. So mechanically, they just need a little bit of restoration, and we'll be writing. Let's look at this a little bit more closely. This is a, an example of someone who replaced this sack with a sack that was too big for the barrel. So when they put it in, it just compressed it. Probably didn't work very well to be filled with ink, and I don't really find any ink in it. <clears throat> but this is, you know, an amateur re restoration, someone who didn't understand probably all that they were doing and didn't realize you need to cut the sack to length to fit inside the barrel. So why were these pens fairly inexpensive? Well, the nibs are the real challenge. I'm not certain this is the original nib on one of the pens. It has that nice spoon feet on the back, but it's pretty soft and it's nice stub with a little bit of an angle to it. So that nib, 
I'm certain and expect to write very, very well. The one that was part of the pencil set is missing the tipping on the left tine. So that's pretty much not going to work as a nib. I could grind it down and turn it into a stub. But this is a classic Waterman 2A nib. I have a few of these as spares. I may even have some with Canada on it, but I can easily replace this nib uh, with one that's has both tines. So that's what allows me to bid on a lot of uh, these items on eBay that can go for a very low price, which is what I look for. And then hopefully I can turn them into great writing instruments with the expertise, tools, and supplies that I have. So I flush every pen that I get, and obviously is a vintage pen, and this is that nib out of the Skywriter, which is the lower end of the Waterman pens. That's just a phenomenal flow. There's no modern pen that I'm aware of that has a flow that is as good as this. And it's coming out pretty clean. So I don't plan to uh, disassemble, knock out the feet or whatever. I'm comfortable that that's going to work well as is. Great vintage feed. One of my viewers talked about why gold filled and gold plated when it can just wear off and tarnish and other things. So I thought it was a good opportunity to compare what I would call a straight brass versus gold filled. So the <clears throat> Waterman's pen is the higher end pen. The Skywriter is a lower end pen. And you can see the difference also in these two bands at the bottom. I wanted to show this just, these are just cleaned with some soap and water. Next I'm going to polish and we'll show you what they look like. And I'm certain after I polish them up, they will both look fairly nice. And when I put wax on them, they'll both have a fairly good resistance and keep their good looks for a while. Here we are with the pens cleaned up, polished, and waxed. And I did take the nib out of both pens. The Waterman's one that has a missing tine. And the nice uh, kind of stubby flexi nib in this Skywriter, but they needed to be cleaned. Uh, feeds needed to be cleaned. Uh, the nibs needed to be cleaned. There was a lot of old ink in it. So what's the difference between polished brass and gold filled? Well, this is the best example I can show you right now. Gold filled just cleans up much nicer. With wax on it, this brass is going to stay shiny for a while. The other difference is, is the higher end Waterman has the box lever in it, whereas the Skyrider, the lower end one, just has a regular lever, which is probably held in by a metal ring. And the pencil also cleaned up very well. So I'm happy about it from that perspective. The regular Waterman has a little bit of bite marks on it. Some people might try to polish those out. I just think it's a sign of age. You know, the engraving on, on all of these is very good. And that's nice. Came out very clean. The engraving's pretty interesting. Skywriter. We have some wear here. Manufactured in Canada by Alco Division. L.E. Waterman Company Limited. Interesting engraving. The feeds in both pens are almost identical. You got that very deep channel with a couple smaller channels inside of it to facilitate the ink leaking out and air coming back in. No fins. Your classic Waterman Ebonite spoon feed that generally produces a very wet rider. Here we have a bladder installed on the Waterman's pen. And here's that replacement nib. Let's see how it works. So one thing I mentioned is that the original bladder that was in here was all scrunched together. So this is how the 
latex sack arrives if you buy it without a neck and I don't buy any of them with a neck and it's too long to fit in to that barrel the person who probably tried to do it didn't cut it you can see how much I cut off of that sack and that way it fits nice in the barrel you want a little bit of clearance at the end and that's what you're going to get so how I measure is I find a sack that just slides in with a little bit of resistance. Might be good to slide it in the right way so it's appropriate. So as it slides in with a little bit of resistance and then it reaches an end. And then I put this section up against it and I note that right about there I need to cut off that end before I put it together. It's a little bit of installing a sack 101. So what to compare these two water bins that I got on eBay? What should we compare them to? Well, here's a pen, a waterman's pen from the 40s, probably after 45. And it has basically the same design clip aesthetically. A little bit larger here because this is a larger pen. Here we have a W5 from the UK, great pen, and also a similar clip, but it has those nice little grooves in the top, a little bit different design, which is a classic for this pen from the UK. And speaking of interesting blue resins, here's an Esterbrook transition pen, no jewel at the bottom which is a very similar resin to that's in the Waterman's. I'm not certain. I have books on Esther Brook. I've read all I can. I'm pretty certain this was an injection molded plastic, but I don't think anybody's been able to duplicate this since Esther Brook stopped production. I think these Waterman's come close to duplicating that look. These all have two small cap bands, which is interesting. The W5, which is more of an upscale Waterman's pen compared to these two from Canada, has uh, three cap bands. And vintage pens a lot of times use the cap bands to indicate the uh, level of the pen, the quality of the pen, the, ex the expense of the pen. So the more cap bands, the bigger they are, the more expensive the pen. So that's an interesting little look at vintages from the 40s. The uh, Skyrider Waterman pen that I got from Canada has quite a bit of a history behind it. Let's we'll see if we can pick up the engraving on the barrel. It's worn a little bit so it's not going to be the easiest to see. I think that works the best. So it's a Skyrider and it's Manufactured in Canada by Alco Division, Ellie Waterman and Company Limited. So in the 30s, Waterman bought Aiken Lambert, and apparently this pen design was inherited when they bought Aiken Lambert. And that also is indicative of the uh, um, engraving and marking on the nib. It's part of Aiken Lambert's trademark. Also, this was made of DuPont pyrolin plastic, which is also what a lot of other pen makers used in their pens. But it is a very interesting example, and I think it was a real steal and a bargain buying it on eBay. And I do think that it was worth the price of the auction without the other two pens being included. So these are two examples of the second generation of the Skywriter. And these are also engraved with Skywriter. And these are made in USA. And you notice they have the box lever, reminiscent of the vintage. And they unscrew with just a few turns. And we'll notice something other interesting about them is they have steel nibs. Uh, Waterman didn't use many steel nibs. And they're marked with a, um, a, num a letter and a number. So this is a medium and this is the broad. I haven't inked these up. 
I'm certain they write well. What I've read is they were excellent writers, and, and the uh, nibs were also identified as Skywriter nibs. So in the 1947 catalog that I have, they make references to these pens, which are commando pens in the tradition. They have the uh, lever fills. They're just identified as Waterman's. Uh, and what's interesting is these both have pull-off caps, and they have two completely different style nibs on them. This is your taper light one, which actually is nice and soft and writes very, very well. And then the other one has your standard Waterman's nib, which also is like semi-soft. But for the time period, that was good. And they also have that nice Art Deco designed clip, which is followed through. So the Skyrider went through three generations and the third generation in the mid 50s had this clip this is not a skywriter this is the cartridge converter pen which has that very interesting nib in it i have a few of these and none of them i'm happy with the way they write that nib is very fine and and not to my liking but it was a good example of the transition that Waterman went through. And I think we just need to revisit very, very quickly a classic 52 to see that box lever. You know, uh, Waterman identified them on the end of the barrel, which, and there's also was engraving on the barrel. You know, just identifying as a Waterman's pen. So that's a little bit of a history and a little bit of how the Skywriter pen fit into the Waterman model series. And it also was first made in Canada when they bought out Aiken Lambert. I filled both Waterman pen with this Pilot Blue Black. It's my now go-to ink for testing out a new pen. Great flow, nice color, and very consistent, and I have a huge bottle of it. So it's good for this type of use. So now we come to that all-important writing part of the review. So we're going to start with the Waterman's pen, which again I date to the mid-40s to maybe the early 50s, but it's a small pen. We'll give you those dimensions. You know, the cap comes off with uh, less than one turn. And it's not a pen that I'm comfortable writing with without posting. It's very light. Here's those weights. It does post very securely, and it makes the pen from a lengthwise usable and also from a weightwise because this is a light pen. And that section is really on the small side, both in diameter and length. Not something I'm comfortable writing with and not something I could write with with long periods of time. But from an aesthetics viewpoint, from a history viewpoint, I really like this pen and the fact that I have a matching pencil is excellent. This is the replacement nib I put in and I'm not extremely happy with how this hole came together. But I'm not going to knock it apart right now. And those tines are a little bit off, but they're soft. So they go back without any effort. Let's see how it puts down ink. So as a vintage pen goes, this is a nice writer, fairly smooth, but like I said, I would still do some modifications, pop out that feed and the nib and do some heat setting maybe, but for the time being we're going to leave it as is. And it's actually softer than I originally thought, and it lays down a ton of ink, which is what you would expect from a vintage pen. So overall... It came out well. Let's look at the Skywriter. This is slightly bigger than the other 
Waterman's pen, which I would definitely put into, probably was marketed as a ladies' pen. This one is in between a ladies' pen and a, and a full-size pen, but they did make a lot of pens in this size range. Here's the dimensions of the pen. The cat comes off with a little over one and a half turns, and this I could definitely use unposted. It is still very light. Here's the weights. Uh, you know, light like the other pen was light, and light like a lot of vintage pens were. It doesn't post as deep. Kind of changes the balance a little bit, but it's still very usable posted. And that section is small, a little bit bigger, but not much bigger than the one in, in the smaller pen. And it's not something that I would be comfortable with with long writing sessions. Let's see how that nib works. Compared to the other Waterman's pen, this nib is just amazingly soft and extremely wet. I mean, it takes no pressure whatsoever to lay down a pretty thick line. It doesn't do as fine a lines in a horizontal, and it does, <laughs> and as usual, this is the first time the pen is railroaded. So I'm not exactly certain why, but that's what it usually does. Welcome to Vintage. So hopefully you've enjoyed this interesting historical study. And there's still great pens to be found on eBay at a very reasonable price. And it certainly beats getting up in the car at 3 a.m. in the morning and trying to get to a flea market and maybe finding one or two pens if you're lucky. <clears throat> so we're going to say... It's the end for now, so thank you for watching. And I'm really having a challenge over the camera. Hopefully you're staying safe and healthy and enjoying your, your life as well as you can and enjoying your pens and writing. Writing a lot. Writing to a lot of people. Writing for yourself. Whatever works is good. Put ink on paper. So this is the end of this video. We're going to say bye. This is one wet pen. I like it.